What's going on, people? We are Tottenham TV back here for another match review of Spurs. I beat Nottingham Forest by three goals to one at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium yesterday, which put Spurs into the top four after Villa's draw with Brentford and also equaled our, be our points tally from the whole of last season, which is quite incredible with seven games to go, 60 points, albeit it was a particularly low tally last season, but uh, finishing eighth in the table. But I guess it's positive signs, isn't it? signs of progress and I think to be fair last season we probably hit this point tally around the same time and then we went on to lose <laughs> like we went on to lose like seven of our last eight games or something getting battered yeah. you know 6-1 by Newcastle getting battered uh, well we lost 4-3 to Liverpool lost to Brentford so it goes to show as well because like the whole way through the season we were like oh we're on the same points tally as last season we're on the same points tally yeah. as last season and now we're on the points tally that we ended on last season but I'm hoping I'm bloody hoping we have a different end to the season this season the last season it was another solid win another good home win I don't think the performance level was um, that different to what we've seen in, in recent weeks I think it was probably a deserved win um, in the end of the day but it was another classic uh, Spurs in the first half could have been 2-1 down but turned it around with a burst in the second half and that yeah. seems to be a theme at the moment yeah, absolutely. And um, I thought Spurs did start the game well. First 20 minutes, I thought we were heavily dominant without creating too much. I mean, Timo Werner was a problem on that left-hand side um, quite a few times. He was getting the better of Nico Williams, I think it was. And um, the first goal was uh, was um, evidence of that, wasn't it? You know, he gets down the left-hand side with a ball played in from Hyung min Son. And Murillo had no other option but to put it in the back of his net. He tried his best, but um, own goal, seeming one of our best friends at the moment. And um, I thought Timo Werner was probably our most dangerous player there in those first 20 minutes when we were heavily on top. Yeah, and it was classic Ange ball. It was actually, if you, the, the build-up play, the approach play was really, really positive. Um, Basuma, who got obviously hooked off at half-time, uh, he was heavily involved in that first goal with some really good knitting of the play together between him, Madison, Son. Plays in Werner on the left-hand side. Classic Werner shifts on to his right, goes to a down to his left, and bam, across the face of goal. Brilliant ball. And he's, those uh, passes with his left foot across the face of goal that he's performing in recent weeks is really paying dividends. And obviously, he got the one with the own goal. Nearly a few minutes later, got one as well, which would have been a carbon copy of the goal we scored at West Ham, which uh, Brennan Johnson makes that run of the near post. And this time, the keeper gets in the way. Ne nearly happened as well. Luton, because Timo mm. Werner, well, it was a Timo Werner, but anyway, it was across the face of goal. And this time, Johnson uh, nearly got over the line but it was just um, millimetres uh, not over the line so that's definitely been something we've been working on in training and definitely is something clearly that the team um, is able to carry on a consistent basis now and Timo Werner you, look, you've got to give him credit because he's getting those positions consistently and the quality is improving, it seems, game by game. And he had another one in the second half as well, which flashed right across the face of goal, which if Brendan Johnson would have gambled, he could have scored. You saw um, after that chance was missed, Brendan Johnson had his head in his hands like that because he knew he should have gambled. He just didn't for some reason on that occasion. So Timo Werner, fair play, um, really starting to add consistency to that delivery. And that's all we were asking for, really. Yeah, and if you bring up the phone for a second, if you look at the progress bar, you could see how heavily dominant in terms of uh, possession we were in the opening 20, 25 minutes. And Nottingham Forest did get a goal out of completely well before they scored that goal. They, before even we scored that goal, they tried uh, something from inside their own half. I think it was Murillo nearly catching Vicario off guard. I think, did he take some inspiration <laughs> from Bruno Fernandes earlier on that day? Yeah, I wonder if he'd be watching the, the Manchester game and he saw that because that would, I mean, I know Robinson scored from like near his own, his own box but in terms of an open play that might that would have been surely the furthest ever i've yeah, never I seen a shot so. from that deep um and vicario was caught absolutely cold i can't believe Mar uh, murillo tried that but uh, we were talking to wolfie about murillo before the game he's a very very confident center back. i didn't realize he's only 21 um seems like a really good prospect and obviously that shows his quality and you gotta have some power in your boots to get a shot over vicario from there and if it wasn't for a bit of luck and Thankfully, it just, just dragged wide, but what an effort. Because it looked like when it bounced just before it hit, like um, just before it went slightly wide, it looked like it maybe was swerving in. But uh, luckily for us, it wasn't. And it saved our blushes and particularly Vicar Vicario's blushes. But when Nottingham Forest did score, first of all, it was terrible defending. A doggy just completely caught in no man's land. Van der Ven comes over to try cover him. And there's just spaces and gaps all over that defence. And um, Chris Wood does what Chris Wood does, especially this season, and put, that's put the ball in the back of the net. I mean, it was completely against the run of play, wasn't it? Yeah, it was 
out of nowhere, really. Forest weren't really threatening. Um, Van der Ven seemed to be mopping up um, everything that went over the top. There was even a moment where I think Hudson Odoi looked like he was about to get in on goal. Van der Ven yeah. comes over like a steam train, wins it back, and he gets like a standing ovation for that recovery. And Van der Ven looked like he was patrolling things. But that did happen. Look, the goal happened. We were completely cut open on the counter attack. Elanga down the right hand side, finding all sorts of space. As you say, a doggy um, caught. Um, caught asleep I think and then Van der Ven is forced to come over because the dog is out of position and no, neither Saar or Basuma um, were covering in the centre and that was really disappointing there was all that space in the centre and yet again it seemed like attackers seem to have to weigh too much time in those situations for us what I would say is uh, Romero was a bit unlucky because when Elanga gets the cross off um, to Wood it does take a bit of a deflection off Romero and just perfectly falls into uh, Chris Wood's path and then Wood's finish goes through the legs of Pedro Porro so it was a bit of luck but I don't think we have we can complain too much about the goal because we were just carved right open and it's a theme where we don't give up too many chances but when we do it seems to be very good quality chances and that yeah. was another that was more evidence of that yeah, absolutely. And then for some reason after that, the whole dynamic of the game changed, particularly uh, obviously the first half. And it looked like heads were dropped, confidence sapped out of them. And Nottingham Forest just really started to put on us. I thought a doggy was having a torrid time uh, down that left-hand side. I thought Nico Williams and Elanga uh, were really getting the better of him at times during that second half. And they nearly scored again, albeit a great save from Vicario. And then Chris Wood has uh, the goal to aim at and smashes it. Um, on the right-hand side of the post where, you know, it was a complete open goal from about three yards out. I don't know what he's thinking. And I don't know how the hell he didn't score that. And if Forrest go 2-1 up at that stage, you know, you're probably fearing the worst. But luckily, luckily he didn't score because Forrest were well on top at that point. Yeah, it was a top save from Vicario because I think he saw it late. You could see with the strike from Yates, uh, low down to his left, I think goes for a couple of bodies and Vicario has to use his um, best reflexes just to get a hand on that. And it was an excellent save, um, really a brilliant save at a crucial time. But how Chris Wood misses that, I don't know what he's thinking. He just, instead of just literally putting in the MTA, he decides I'm going to just smash this into the net for God knows what reason. And luckily for us, it just smacks off the post and we get a bit of luck. Obviously, falls to Gibbs White after that and his strike is uh, wide. But we've just got massive, massive let off. And actually, in that moment as well, Porro got, got caught out because it, mm. it was a lovely ball over the top to uh, Ole Aina and he takes it on the chest brilliantly. Uh, Pedro Porro goes to the header, completely misjudges it and they were in behind. And at that moment, uh, Forrest would look like they were building some momentum, but that missed chance was a big turning point uh, in the game because if they get that, as you say, that puts them perfectly in the situation they want to be, in the lead, able to play on the counter-attack as well, and it gives them something to really hang on to. And in the situation they're in, battling for relegation, when you take the lead at somewhere like Spurs and that in, at that point in the game, that would have been very, very difficult because you just imagine they're just going to put nine men or ten men behind the ball and it's going to be very hard to break down. Luckily for them, they missed it. We had a fairly strong end to the half. I remember Brendan Johnson had a cross deflected onto the crossbar. But I guess the moment uh, that Nuno was complaining about after the game was the Madison moment just before the break where uh, he has a little swipe at uh, Yates. Uh, he goes down uh, like a ton of bricks. He's calling for VAR. And uh, Madison, I think, who was actually already on the yellow, someone said. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but apparently he was no, already... He didn't. he didn't get booked. No, he was in already on the yellow when that no, happened? he didn't get booked in the game, no. Didn't get booked at all. Okay, so he was... Look, let's be honest, he was very fortunate in that moment not to uh, get reprised with VAR. I think he just got away with it because there wasn't, like, an active, like, pullback of the arm. Yeah, and... I guess that's the only thing you can say. You, uh, the, apparently, the AR judged it wasn't violent conduct um, from James Madison. But maybe that was evidence of him losing his cool and being frustrated because, again, he just wasn't having the best game uh, on on the day. Uh, he admitted that after the game that he's not in his best form. He feels like he's getting close to it, but he's not in his best form right now. And Ryan Yates was... Um, pretty much hovering over him wasn't he the whole game I think he made a number of fouls on him I think he made like three or four fouls during the game a few of them on Madison and Madison maybe getting a bit frustrated that wherever he looked Yates was there and maybe at that moment he just lost his cool yeah no he did and he shouldn't be doing that he gives the referee a and VAR a decision to make at that point and yeah luckily for us he didn't get sent off but you know on another day if the referee pulls out the card there VAR ain't overturning that so 
as much as I don't think maybe it was a red card, it does give the referee a decision make. So I think it's silly play uh, from Madison. But then again, Forrest should have been down to 10 men with an absolutely horrendous challenge. I think it was on Madison, wasn't it? With, um, it was on Lo Celso. With, sorry, yeah. with Lo Celso later on in the game with a high foot into the knee. I mean, how the hell? First of all, how the hell is the ref not spotting that? And how the hell is VAR not picking that up? Yeah horrendous challenge he only he did get a booking straight away i don't know why var doesn't go back and say that's a terrible challenge because we've seen what um we've seen challenges work that aren't as bad as that var go back to and say actually this is violent conduct in it and should be red card you look at romero's one against chelsea uh, i don't think that was as bad as what da uh, danilo did yesterday and that was pulled up and um given a red card so i think they got very lucky in that situation to not be down to 10 men yeah but nuno was complaining about the madison moment i do think if those moments go in forest favor the the moment that hit the post and obviously the madison red card that would have been a very very difficult game for us um and we did lose control a bit in those moments like we did get a bit lucky in those moments that it went in our favour. Madison doesn't get the red card. But I would say Ryan Yates, he's such a prick, isn't he? I absolutely he's hate. Dirty, oh, dirty he's plan. so dirty. And as well, let's be honest, as much as it was a, a bit of a... Um, a well, I don't even know if you can call it as violent as a punch, but a bit of a hit by Madison at the moment. Yates was not hurt by that, let's be honest. And he goes down as if he's been shot in the stomach. And uh, it was obviously a ploy to get Madison sent off. And the fact Madison did that, as you say, of course, he literally lost his call. I'm sure he'll admit that after the game, that it wasn't something he was proud of. And he, it was just a brain, brainless moment from him, a head loss moment, I should say, for Madison. But Yates tried to take full advantage of it, didn't he? And he's such a dirty player. He makes so many fouls, and he's one of those players who just winds up the opposition, a bit of a shit house. and he nearly got the better of Madison, but luckily for us, the referee didn't call him up on it. Yeah, he's basically another Neil Morpai, isn't he? Uh, one of these kind of players. And look, you expect players to make a meal out of these things to try and gain an advantage in the game. You've seen it time and time again, year after year in the Premier league you even saw it in the arsenal brighton game on the weekend i don't know if you saw it um i can't remember which brighton player it was but he had a bit of a coming together with uh, ben white mm. and ben Esther white Pinion, it was yeah Esther Pinion. and ben white just goes down holding his neck like he's been slashed in the throat or something it was unbelievable i yeah. couldn't believe what i was seeing with ben white that now that was embarrassing yeah and i don't know if you saw roy Keane's comments after the game with ryan about ryan yates he said you know He's a player who likes to give it, but as soon as Madison gives it back a bit, he's you know on the on the floor like a sack <laughs> of bricks, and he can't he, he doesn't want to take it. So I think that there's a something to say about that. But we went into halftime obviously at one one. Again, a disappointing uh, first half from Spurs. Again, a first half where we could have we could have been behind, but again, a first half where we don't go into the um, halftime leading. Uh, again, in another game just off the back of Tuesday where we had a bright start. It was one that we were leading at halftime. No, it was one one. Oh, it was 1-1, one, one. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Chris Wood. It was, and um, it was very similar to the game. Yes, we on, scored in the first yeah, half this yeah. time. It was very similar to the game on Tuesday in terms of how the first, second, first half went. Very bright start, got the opening goal. We were in the in control in the ascendancy. And then out of nowhere, we concede an equaliser and we go into the second half at 1-1. One, one. But the difference between this, uh, this time is he made a double change at half time. Yeah, and I thought rightly so, because I think Basuma... As much as he, I, I thought actually Basuma started the game well um, in the first 20 minutes. I, re, I was really enjoying Basuma's performance, defensively sound, uh, contributing to the attack. He even had a few shots from 20, 25 yards, which I think was a clear instruction from Ange before the game because it seems as though we were looking for the shot a lot more in this game than we had previously. And obviously, Ange did mention it in his pre match press conference saying, Yes, my players are allowed to shoot, and they showed <laughs> they're, they're allowed to shoot um, in this game. And obviously, that's where the Van der Ven goal came from. But Pat Mate Sara, I don't think, was at the races for pretty much uh, the whole of the uh, first half, to be honest. And um, Sar was rightly taken off. And Basuma, after they scored, I just think he just completely let his standards slip as well. So I think both of them were warranted to be taken off. And the two players that did come on in Hoivier and Bentank will completely change the course of the game. Yeah, and it's no surprised that I think we were restricting Forrest a lot more in that second half after Hoybier and Bentacor came on. I think it was more to do with what they were doing off the ball than on the ball as, as much because I thought on the ball Basuma and Saar 
I mean, weren't terrible. I thought Basuma, obviously heavily involved in the first goal, was doing pretty some good stuff. But off the ball, as we saw with those chances created by Forrest, a lot of them coming from uh, Basuma just not doing his job defensively. Not Sometimes it annoys me with Basuma where he, he notices dan danger, but he doesn't like busting up to get in the box and, and, and fix it. He kind of just ambles back in and uh, allows uh, the opposition to kind of get a chance. And obviously Ryan Yates for that chance, which uh, forced to save out Vicario. He had all the time in the world to line up that shot yeah. and like no pressure on him. And that was really frustrating. But once B Basuma and ben um, once Bentancur and Hoybier came on, I felt like they just added that bit more bite, a bit more intensity and said after the game that he felt like it wasn't so much that Saar and Basuma were doing terrible. It's just more he wanted more legs on the pitch. He wanted a bit more <laughs> intensity. And that's definitely what Bentancur and Hoybier uh, provided. And as well, I felt like they provided a bit more purpose with their passing uh, in terms of Hoybia was playing some really good long range passing getting the ball forward quickly with some accuracy they made a really good impact um, in that in that first half in that um, first opening exchanges and obviously we started the, the half really well Brendan Johnson had a chance at the back post again from Averna um, cross which uh, he kind of goes with his boot where maybe he should have gone with his head and that, that was a chance missed and then obviously we get the goal which uh, everyone was saying shoot 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 to everyone I think Johnson had a chance to shoot he didn't take it Son had a chance to shoot he didn't take it I think Van der Ven said after the game you know I, I felt once I got that ball I'm just going to lever it because someone had to bloody shoot so and what a shot it was didn't think he had that kind of effort in him it's quite funny Madison said uh, in his interview after the game that if you, if you watch training uh, it's fair to say Van der Ven's shooting is not one of his strong points <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's something that uh, he's been criticised for in training but you wouldn't have known it because what an effort absolute yeah. hammer, hammer hammer blow wasn't it what a, what a shot right into the top corner as well great technique and um he was our best player even without the goal, and that just cemented it. That, that yeah, strike. unbelievable. I mean, I'm surprised that uh, the ball didn't break the net. That's mm. how strong it was. Uh, it was unbelievable to see. And after all the times that he saved us in the first half um, with the counter-attacks that Villa were trying to pose, um, it was only right for him to score a goal like that. And yeah, you're right. I mean, it was frustrating at times just saying, shoot, 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 shoot. And then Van de Ven is the one that just takes it, uh, you know, one touch on his left foot and then bang, uh, rifling it into the top corner. Unbelievable goal. Um, and it just kind of set us on our way and the stadium kind of came to life after that. And um, there was only one team that were really going to win it after Van de Ven um, hit that shot and again Spurs scoring in clusters because another goal from a defender from Pedro Porro great ball into the box from James Madison lovely guided header from uh, Rodrigo Bentancourt to find Pedro Porro and then first time bang into the far corner and um, another defender scores for Tottenham and now that's what is it four goals for Romero two goals for Van de Ven two goals for a doggy and two goal and one or two goals for Porro uh, two in the all, all comps, mm. one in one in the Premier League. A brilliant finish. We know that Porro has that technique, don't we, on a, on his right foot. When it fell to him, even though he hasn't scored in the Premier League this season, you just felt like he's going to hit the target here because he's got a brilliant strike. He's actually, if you look at all his goals he scored for Spurs, I think all every single one. I don't think he's ever scored like a tap in uh, Pedro Porro. It's always an absolute banger. He's got an unbelievable strike on him. It was a brilliant finish there. But actually, in terms of the goal, I want to talk about Ben Tankle because. When I watched it first, I wasn't sure if he was like going for goal and he just um, miss hit the header. But if you look on the replay, there was a, there was a slow mo replay they showed on match of the day when the ball comes in from Madison. You can very clearly see that Ben Tenkor, when he flicks the header, he immediately looks to the right. I think I think he knew that there was two players there at the back post, completely free. There was Poro, and I think Udogi, I think as well, was also free there. But it falls to in Ryan to Poro's path, brilliant strike right into the roof of the net. Um, excellent um, technique from from Pedro Poro, and he should be doing more of that. Um, get in the box and scoring those goals because he's got that in him uh, he's got a brilliant finish on him he's one of the best striker of the balls uh, from fullback I think in the Premier League we all know that and that goal was a long time coming he should be a player who aims to get you know five goals a season I think he's that good uh, with, with his technique obviously he's on seven assists as well so we know he's got ability to be effective in the final third obviously with that brilliant goal against Burnley um, in January as well in the FA Cup so we know he's got a brilliant strike on him he should be getting more goals and that was evidence of it and um, yeah, again, Tottenham capitalising on momentum and, and um, playing in waves and they couldn't handle us when we were playing very quickly and we made it 3-1. And uh, I th you felt like 3-1 
the game wasn't really uh, in doubt. Have we given up a two goal lead yet this season? I don't, I don't think, think so. so. I don't no. think we've given up a lead once we've got two goals ahead. So I think we're very good in those situations. What I would say is once we went to 3 1, uh, we had a couple of openings. Werner flashes a ball across the face of goal, which uh, no one taps home. Uh, someone should have. I think Son, obviously, very late on in the game, had a shot that hit the post. But we didn't really go for the throw, I felt. I felt at 3-1, it's almost as, as if at times we felt like the game was won and we were just playing it around. Maybe, look, you could argue at those points you want to calm it down a bit. You don't want to allow too much chaos because you don't want to allow Forrest back into the game. And I think we did a good job just kind of um, restricting Forrest at that moment, apart from the moment where Hoybier just plays a I suicidal ball. did a good job the... predicting 3-1 and predict the Prem. Yeah, I definitely, yeah, maybe they knew uh, <laughs> that, that I had 3-1, so they calmed it down a bit, but... I did feel like as well I was a bit frustrated because I felt a few times uh, in the last like 25 minutes or so we had some really good opportunities to play some really quick football, get up the pitch quickly and go on a counter and we just decided to slow it down, play it backwards and instead of going forward and allow Forrest like time to settle and stuff and at those moments you're free one up, you know Forrest have to come out and you know they're, they're desperate for points so they can't uh, just allow that game to see out to, to a loss they need to go for goals and I felt like we didn't take advantage of that situation as much as I would have hoped maybe that will come in time uh, once we have better control of games maybe we just because I think we have been guilty as well this season is to be fair where we have a good position we're in the lead and we allow the opposition back into the game for our own sloppiness and chaos and just trying to play 100 miles an hour all the time so I think that that's a fair criticism maybe we did a better job of controlling the game yesterday but I just felt like for those last 20 minutes we could have done a bit a better job of exploiting Forrest coming at us rather than just kind of taking what we have and and, and sitting on it yeah no I agree with that and I, I want to um, talk about Ben Tancor and, and also Pierre and Mahoybier who did come on at half time because I mentioned before how I thought they, they really changed the course of the game and they gave us that calm and drive in the middle of the park um, I call it like maybe chaotic calmness uh, <laughs> from um, from Ben Tancor and Hoybier because they're not you don't associate with maybe Ben Tancor but definitely not Hoybier with being like car, a calm player and I thought that they added so much to that midfield albeit Hoybier nearly did put his uh, good work down uh, to waste right at the end when he did play that bad pass out the back and Nottingham Forest did nearly score. But I thought both of them put in such great performances and definitely Hoybier, who hasn't really had a look in in terms of starting lineups. I think he's put himself in the conversation now to be starting. What I would say is I was actually, I was, I agree with you. I thought they had a brilliant impact and I thought the intensity they brought to the midfield, I think it's just more the bite they, they brought to that midfield, um, making sure that the Yates, Gibbs White, Gibbs White and Danilo just weren't having the influence they were in the first half and all of a sudden they were getting heavily restricted because of the energy they brought and it was brilliant. I thought going forward, obviously, Bentecon and Hoybier um, added that bit more technical ability uh, in, the, in the final third, a bit more accurate passing, forward passing as well, quicker passing. That comes when, you know, fresh legs at half-time, you can add that intensity. I thought Bentecon had a fantastic overall half I thought he was brilliant obviously got involved in the third goal as well and I thought going forward he was fantastic they, they found it so hard to get the ball of him Hoybier had a brilliant impact but I actually felt in the last 15 minutes he was putting us in not it wasn't just that situation where he plays a blind pass across the face of goal and gives the ball straight to Forrest and they nearly get a goal from it I thought he was really sloppy in those last like 10 minutes gave the ball away a few times in really bad positions and I was starting to get really frustrated with him so I thought a lot of the I wouldn't say all his good work was undone because obviously we were 3-1 up at that point but I thought um, the impact he made diminished in the, in the latter stage of the game and I was getting very frustrated with how sloppy he was being and a bit careless I think is the best word for it just being very very careless on the ball so that is something that we know Hoybier is capable of. What, I feel like with Hoybier, he has to be like 100% concentration to, to be at his best. As soon as he lets that slip a bit, he just starts being a bit careless, playing blind balls nowhere, and he lets his touch get away, get, get away from him and his passes start getting sloppy. And I thought that was happening in the last 10 minutes, to be honest. But a lot, a lot of the good work he did made, made sure we were 3-1 up, so I can't uh, take that credit away from him, but I was frustrated with his last uh, last 10 minutes of the game. Yeah, obviously if we let in a goal at that moment through his bad work, I think it's going to be highlighted a lot more, but like me, I, I prefer to just focus on, on the good play that he did do in the game, because I think for the majority of the time that he was on the pitch, I thought he was one of the best players on the park. Uh, that's how good I thought he was. Um, really combative in the middle, his long balls out... Um, out wide I thought with pinpoint he was taking shots as well I think he had what 
three or four shots mm. um, in that second half. So again, that clear instruction to shoot on sight from Spurs. Yeah, I think Basuma had four in the first half. Hoybia had four in the second half. Uh, Son had one. Van der Ven had one that he obviously scored from. So it's great to see that finally Spurs are taking sh some shots instead of just continuing with that shoehorn football. Yeah, and it obviously paid off because Van der Ven scored from 25 yards. So it's a tactic that we know against a low block, you sometimes you just got to try your luck and see what happens. Some, sometimes in golfing or deflection, and you see the best teams, uh, especially I think Liverpool, out the t teams at the top of the best are doing it in terms of just peppering the opposition with um, loads and loads of shots. And more often than not, it, that will um, help break the deadlock. And usually they'll get a bit of luck. You and you make your own luck in in this sport. And obviously there was nothing lucky about Van der Ven's goal. It was a brilliant goal, but I think the clear instruction that if there's not too many opportunities to break down the opposition. Just try your luck from distance. Definitely paid off. I think Hoybia forced a brilliant save ourselves as well just after the, the break as well. So I think we had some really good efforts from distance in this game and that definitely helped us uh, get the three points. Yeah. Um, in terms of James Madison, let's... Um Let's look at him in terms of his stats in the game. You can see from the heat map, uh, that's where you want James Madison, and that's where you see him uh, for the most part. I did think that he was poor in the first half, but did um, kind of grow with the team in the second half. Four key passes on the day, two shots blocked, um, four out of his six ground jewels won, and fouled three times. I think every single one of those fouls were probably from Yates. But... <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I don't think Madison put in a bad performance by any stretch of the imagination, but I do think that it's nowhere close to the levels that we know that James Madison can provide. Yeah, and I think Madison admitted that after the game. He said he feels like he's not on the form that he said won him Player of the Month earlier in the season, and he's uh, for one reason or another he's just not at that level at the moment. And he and he, said, and he admitted that he says he's very self-critical, and he admits he's not at that level for one reason or another. But he says also he doesn't feel like he's too far away, and yeah. he feels like he's getting there. I see Madison I, again. I still see him doing some brilliant stuff. The way again he moves his body, he swivels on the ball. It's so hard for um, midfielders to to kind of track that and that's why he gets fouled so many times and as you say four key passes I think that's more than anyone else on the pitch so clearly he's still creating opportunities and he's still doing stuff on the pitch which is great and obviously he was heavily involved in the third goal as well brilliant work great down the ball. left hand side good ball to Ben Tancor and um uh, and I, he was involved in the first goal as well with some good link up between him, Son and Basuma to get Werner in down the left-hand side. So there's still some really good stuff there from Madison, but you just know he's got so much more to give. You know he's got so much more quality in his boots where he's got magic in his boots. What, I'm, what I guess what I'm saying is at the moment, I'm seeing some like good stuff. I'm not seeing the magic that we know he's capable of. Yeah. And this is a player that you know from those deep positions can play the ball on a sixpence over the top. He can fire a shot in from 25 yards into the top corner. Uh, he can have some magical moments. I think he's missing that sprinkle of magic at the moment for one reason or another. And again, it was another game, I guess, taken off on the 70th minute for Giovanni Lo Celso, who had a pretty good, pretty good cameo, I thought, again, uh, for the final 20 minutes. Um, again, uh, uh, another game he hasn't got a goal or assist, so play into the narrative that he's not having the best time. But again, I, I agree. I don't think it was his best performance by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think he was, it was a stinker or he was poor. And we know he's got more to give, but for one reason or another, he's just not hitting those heights he was earlier in the season, which when we know he's got that in him, it's going to be frustrating when he's not there at the moment. But that's the thing, right? You're always going to be kind of judged against your, against your past performances. And when people know what he can produce, like in those first 10 games of the season, when he was literally the best uh, or one of the best uh, attacking midfielders in the Premier League, you're always going to be judged on that. And when you put in performances like you are doing recently, you're going to get criticised for it. And that's the nature of fandom, I guess. But I, for, I for one, I see this more as a snapshot in time rather than something that... Uh, is going to be an ongoing situation, although you could argue it has been going on for a couple of months. So that is something to, to say and to be concerned about. But I still see uh, the value in having Madison in the team, even when he's yeah. in this kind of form. So he's going to be judged because he had such a good start. That's, that's the level he's going to be held to. And I'm sure he holds himself to that level as well. But at the moment, it's not working out like that. Yeah. And um, Kulisevsky did come on, didn't he, for the last five 
final 15 minutes. And I thought, again, another really poor display uh, from Decky. I mean, there were so many times he gets the ball and there's he's, he's got runners off him. He's got the opportunity to play the ball, just dallies on the ball, waits too long. And ultimately, the moves break down. And I thought it was a really frustrating cameo from Kulisevsky. Yeah, I think the, there, there's a difference. I think Kulisevsky actually had a stinker when he came yeah. on. And I thought he had a stinker when he came on against uh, West, West Ham. Ham as well. So he's in a very low moment at the moment, I have to say, Decky. I feel for him because I know he's trying. I don't see a player who's not trying. I see him uh, trying to pull things off. You know he's he's a high-quality player. He's capable of p um, pulling things off that he's not at the moment. But I have to say, every time he got the ball, he was giving it away. He had really promising openings. There was like one moment, I think it was Lo Celso, plays him for on goal. And he just slow instead of like going for the penalty box and charging at his defender he slows himself down kind of looks for the pass and as soon as uh he takes those extra few seconds the passing lane is blocked and and his pass gets blocked uh he actually started off on the left hand side which was uh, something that uh, a lot of people been calling for him to play he didn't look totally comfortable there to be honest uh, on the left hand side in the beginning bit was uh, not doing very well, moved over to the right. I thought he was getting a bit more joy in terms of his positioning on the right-hand side. But again, whenever he got the ball to feet, the quality was absolutely missing from Kulisevsky. And uh, he's in a very low moment. He hasn't. He's playing not great in the moment. Obviously, he's lost his place in the team now. I don't know if that's affecting him. But when he's come off the bench recently, he's been having a stinker, let's be honest. And I thought yesterday was probably the worst of the lot, to be honest. Yeah. And I, f I feel for him. I totally agree, and um, it, it looked like to me a player that was struggling with confidence. Um, but it's obviously easy to say that, but um, he's just not making decisions quick enough at the moment. He's not acting on those decisions quick enough, and um, he needs to improve massively if he wants to get his place back in the team. Because you're looking at the likes of Timo Werner and Brennan Johnson, both playing really well at the moment, and both providing exactly what Ange Postecoglou winger needs to provide. If you bring up this heat map of, of Timo Werner. Um, that's where you need to be. If you're on the left wing on, on an Ange system, you need to be tugging that touchline, cutting inside to, to provide those low-driven crosses um, where, where you can see on that heat map. And I think Timo Varner put in a brilliant display yesterday. I said before he was probably our most dangerous player in the first half. And in the second half, he was just a constant thorn in... Um, the Nottingham Forest side and he was getting his better of uh, the fullback time and time again and providing good um, opportunities for our players to score with. Yeah, I think Nico Williams will be having sleepless nights about uh, Timo Werner after yesterday's performance because every time he got the ball it felt like he was running at him, giving him trouble uh, and he he struggled to deal with him to be honest he just basically couldn't stop Werner getting to the byline on his left foot and whenever Werner got into that position he was providing quality as we say got the assist for the own goal nearly got an assist for Brennan on a couple of occasions um, and it nearly won in the second half as well those that quality of his left foot is something that I questioned when he first came here and, and was as well in his earlier performances I was questioning whether he has that ability on his left foot to consistently be putting those crosses across the face of goal but he's proven me wrong at the moment because he got a brilliant assist and I think if you take into account own goals and you take into account that assist he got through Doggy where uh, it probably pretty much was a um, assist for Werner it was just a bit lucky that um, a doggy had a shot that it was blocked in the fell to him and he scored it was pretty much another assist for Werner that's two goals and, f and five assists in eight starts now for Timo Werner that's seven goal contributions in eight starts so he's really providing consistently last few weeks as well it seems to be very, very difficult to stop. Uh, it seems as though like everyone knows what he's going to do, but they can't really stop it at the moment. And I can't really complain because that's all we want from him. And he's doing exactly what Ange wants him to. And he's providing a really good um, outlet on, on his left foot, on the left wing, staying wide. And he's getting assists. I don't think he's like doing anything special. He's doing simple things very effectively. And that's exactly what we need him to do. And I'll tell you what, like, we've been... A bit critical of Timo Werner on this channel in terms of when we're talking about do we want him to be here next year and uh, I think we've both been in agreement like a lot of times when we've spoken about it in various videos saying nah I think we need someone better than Timo but I think you've mentioned it as well in some of the videos saying that if we if we sign Timo and another left winger uh, to combat him as well I think that would be a very good options to have for next season I, I don't think I was in agreement with you but I think looking at him now looking at his previous performances now looking at his time at Tottenham as a whole he's growing on me week by week he's growing on me and it's not just what he's doing well it's also his mentality on the football pitch the way he's kind of ingrained himself in the um, the team as well 
I just think he looks like a really settled player and he's probably in his best moment for a couple of years now um, in his career. I think so. And he seems very happy. You see after the game, he's dancing with Vicario and he's uh, he feels really, really big part of the team at the moment. He's got such a great relationship with all, all his teammates, which is an important aspect. And I think as well, the way the the kind of player he is, the way he plays, I think he does. He could have a value next season, uh, especially as a squad player and filling in in some games in midweek or even Champions League games. He's got Champions League experience as well, and also off the bench against tired legs, where you you can even see at the moment he's getting assists at the start, where you know the fullback should have fresh legs uh, to deal with him, and he's able to get to the byline consistently and get those crosses in. Imagine him next season, if we have, I don't know who it is, let's say we have like a Nico Williams on the left wing tiring out a defender, then they've got Timo Werner to come on, and even though you know what Timo Werner's going to do, defenders are just finding it very, very difficult to stop that, and that's all you need, him to do those really simple things really effectively. And at 15 million, I mean, you can't really go too much wrong. The only problem I would have is if we sign him and we use that as a justification to not really go big on another winger yeah. that's what I'd be disappointed in because I don't think as much as I love Timo I think I, I really like him as a person I think he's been a really good player for us I don't think as a, as a winger to be relied upon as our first choice winger is going to take us to the next level even from what I'm seeing now as much as he's good um, I don't know if that's going to be good enough to take us to where we want to be, which is really challenging that top three. But as a squad player, as a player who could effectively come on as a sub and fill in in certain games, I think he's more than good enough, to be honest, uh, from what I'm seeing at the moment. Because he's the reason is he's doing exactly what Ange wants him to. And if he can listen to what Ange wants and, and put it into practice, that's all I can ask for. Yeah, absolutely. And Brennan Johnson on the other side, if you bring up his heat map as well. Um, this is what I was talking about at the Luton game, about the you know the positions that each of these players occupy. And when Kulisevsky does start on the right-hand side, he's cutting in way too much. And that's not a hallmark. That's not what Ange Postecoglou wants to see from his winger. This is what he wants to see from his winger. Really at, um, stay wide, provide options, provide quality. And I think Brendan Johnson's doing this from time and time again. A, a couple of times he got on the ball and started attacking his full back and, and got the better of him on a number of occasions. On another day, you're probably talking about T, uh, Brendan Johnson ending the game with a golden assist um, mm. with what he showed on it. I don't think it was his best performance by any stretch of the imagination, but he was a th constant threat. He exactly. He still was involved. He should have scored that goal where Timo laid on a plate for him. That was that one moment again in the second half, which I pointed out. He, for one reason or another, he just decided not to gamble at the back post, and he knew he should have in that moment. And uh, he probably cost himself a goal by not gambling. But there was one moment I want to pick out, which I think, which I picked out actually on Tuesday, and he did it again in this game. And this was he got the ball on the right hand side, and in, and instead of I, I think. Um, the uh, defender was like getting prepared to show him to for him to like burst down the line and instead of doing that he actually s spotted a gap in the center and he burst centrally um and 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 kind of went um horizontal instead of just go, uh, running vertically he actually um ran horizontally right across the penalty area and exploited that space and laid on a chance for uh Hume Min Son who uh, hit the post and that is something he's gonna have to add to his uh, repertoire if he's gonna become this winger who's a bit more unpredictable because yes we know he's so quick and he can get to the byline very very effectively and has a good delivery but once he shows a propensity to also go inside and um, kind of run at his defenders that way then he's going to become a lot harder to stop because all of a sudden defenders are not going to go what, what we're not going to know which direction he's going in and what way to go and he's becoming in the last two games from what I've seen he's becoming a lot more effective running inside not just outside as well obviously the next stage is being able to cut inside and shoot. We haven't really seen too much of that. He usually tries to be a provider at the moment. And that's that's fine as long as he's being effective. And I feel like he is at the moment. Um, but I want to see more displays of that finishing ability we saw at Forrest because we know he's got a good shot on him. We know he's got a good finish. And we haven't quite seen that. At t Although he's got a few goals, it's more from the runs he's been making rather than you know the uh, good quality Stick finishes, finishing, yeah. which apart from the one against um, Villa, the only time we've really seen that finishing ability from him. So I want to see more from that. But I like he's becoming a bit more unpredictable and he's still doing those things that Ange wants to do, which is running at the back post and obviously taking on his man and whipping those uh, crosses uh, across the face of goal. So he's looking so he's improving uh, week on week. I wouldn't say this was an improvement, but it was, I felt... Um, just sustaining a good level of performance from him. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm really happy with Brendan Johnson. I'm really happy with Timo Werner, what they're providing for the team at the moment. Um, 
I guess, yeah, uh, that's that's what it is. The game was 3-1. It was a good victory for Spurs. I would say comfortable for the most part, apart from a few moments in the game where we probably should have done better from. But I want to finish off talking about where we might think Spurs are at at the moment, because I'm seeing a lot of kind of criticism to Ange, criticism to Spurs about maybe not blowing away teams week in, week out, and maybe Spurs fans maybe got a bit too ahead of themselves after the first 10 games. But I'm looking at the team and looking where we're at, looking at everything that we had to go through, and I couldn't be happier with maybe where Spurs are at right now, into the top four in Ange's first season after losing Harry Kane, a, a pretty much a completely new 11 to start the season with as well. And I can't, if, if I want to compare it to another team, I'm looking at this Spurs team where we're at, maybe very comparable to maybe the Arsenal team that finished fifth when we pipped them to fourth in that season. And I'm looking at the Spurs team and I'm seeing a lot of progression going forward. Yes, maybe we're not as good as the first 10 games of the season, but it was always going to be hard. You're looking at what we've done this season, unbeaten this season so far with our starting first choice back four, uh, which is unbelievable to think about that. And in terms of the home form this season, yes, we went on a dodgy run when the injuries first came with the West Ham, the Villas and, and the Wolves. But our home form has been impeccable apart from that. You know, we've only lost Wolves apart from in that little period. So I think Spurs fans should be really happy with the direction that this team are going in right now. Yeah, no, I know. I'm not really sure what more Spurs fans expect at this current point in Ange's tenure. We're, eight, we're seven months in now. Um, we're in the top into the top four. We're adding a bit more consistency in terms of how we approach games. Yes, within game, we do sometimes, well, often, I would say, struggle to have real control over 90 minutes for the whole game. And so we are letting the opposition maybe in a few too many times than maybe we should. And some, some of the chances we concede are maybe a bit too uh, good a quality. But nothing's going to be perfect at, at this point in time. We're not going to be this perfect, well-oiled team uh, like prime Barcelona, like after seven months. It's never going to happen. Even with, you know, the best team in the world, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to get to those levels that quickly. And to get to the level that we're at as quickly as we have, for me, is very, very impressive. I think Ange has got this group together uh, in a really impressive way. Clearly, everyone is uh is feel is a family feel you see how everyone gets on with each other but it's not just that i think the football that we play when we're when we're on it and when we're we're free flowing we're very very difficult to stop and that's not easy to get even at this point in time uh it's very very difficult to even get to that stage so quickly and i see some of the football we play is an absolute delight to watch yes there are points where Obviously, teams are going to come and try and stop you. They're, they're going to study us. They're going to see how we play. They're going to try and stop us. And a lot of the time at the moment, in first halves, that is happening. But sometimes the game has to play out to know what you've got to do to win the game, if you know what I mean. Sometimes when the game plays out, you have to see what the opposition are doing. You have to see how they're, um, how they're kind of uh, taking to the game, how they're appro approaching the game, sorry, is the better term for it. And then you figure out what you guys need to do to get over that opposition, get over that challenge. And at the moment, in these first halves, we're, we're having a lot of challenges at the moment. Teams are coming out in certain ways to try and stop us and getting some joy in some ways. But the most important thing is, in the second half, we rectify those situations and we end up on top. We end up winning the game. And that's not easy to do. That's a lot easier said, um, uh, said than done, I should say. And I think people are taking these wins for granted, taking this consistency for granted, winning eight of the last nine home games. They're just taking that for granted as, as if that's very, very easy to do at this level in time well actually it's very very difficult to do and a lot of teams most teams at this stage of their tenure don't have anywhere near the level of consistency we're showing at the moment and yes we are benefiting from a lack of european football and a bit of a freshness and all these kind of different things but to be in the top four um, to score the level of goals we have at this point in time is very very impressive yes we should all strive for better we should all not rest until we, we are this perfect team and there are problems of course there are problems we haven't had that consistency since the first 10, 10 games even when we've had our best 11 fit it hasn't quite been the same level of control we showed in those games but I think people take for granted how difficult it is uh, to get to those levels and how difficult it is to be in the stage that we are at the moment. And I think, look, when you look at it, the season as a whole at the moment, you pretty much, if it wasn't for that terrible run after the Chelsea game, or even in that, in that period, there should have been games we should have won where we were very unfortunate. 
Like we would have, we would be right up there challenging the top three right now if it wasn't for that run where we lost four and four and five games. So we're really not that far away in terms of how we're playing. I'm sure next season's going to be even different sets and more sets of challenges once you're in Europe. We have to handle that as well. So who who's to say? come next season where we are going to be out we don't know it depends on the signings we make and all that kind of stuff but I honestly I agree I think we're in a really great position I think the progress has been unbelievable and if we're progressing this quickly right now imagine another summer even more time uh, and with the players imagine more time for him to kind of reshuffle the squad knowing who fits the system who doesn't more time to get players he wants in the, into the team I think we're going to fly. And I think the not only the fan, I feel that, I think the players feel that as well, the way they're speaking. And I think that's the most important thing. And I'm just talking about, look, yes, I'm, you know, I see progress, but I'm looking at the title challenge. I'm not going to be happy until we're challenging for a title. And that's the mentality already that our squad is having. Yeah, absolutely spot on. And you're looking at, you know, 11 points behind the top right now, right? Behind Arsenal. And how many points do you reckon we actually dropped because of this mad injury crisis that we do have? I reckon it's maybe not as much as 11, but definitely around that ballpark figure. So if you take that injury crisis away, yeah, I know like every team are going to deal with injuries and going to have injuries. And it's how you kind of use the squad to get the best out of um, and get the consistent results. And we didn't have that squad this season. Once we do have this squad and we can uh, kind of cope with these injuries, you're going to see a much different uh, team and a much more consistent team. And I do think that if these injuries didn't happen, like you're saying, we would be much closer to the top than we are now. And I think we're equal points in front of Man United now and behind Arsenal. And to be at this stage, to be in fourth, to be... like If I told you at the beginning of the season, with seven games to go, we'll be only 11 points behind the top. Mm. You would have thought I'm crazy, like losing Harry Kane and and uh, a new manager and a new system and bet, trying to bet in a whole completely new 11 in one season. You would have thought I was crazy. So to be 11 points behind with the injury crisis that we've had already this season as well, I, I think you can only take your hat off to Ange Postacoglu and, and the players as well uh, for the way they've dealt with everything uh, that have come their way. So... I think the running is tough, though. The run, look, yeah, yeah, fine. The running is tough, and whatever happens, happens. But to be where we are right now, with seven games to go in this position, I think is nothing short of miraculous. Yeah, and I think we're going to be relishing these last few games. I know you could argue we are struggling to beat the likes of Forest and Luton. We're only just getting over the line, but it's a different challenge. It's a different game. These ga these ga uh, teams against Liverpool City and Arsenal that we've got coming up, these are teams going for the title. They're not going to be playing the way that Forest and Luton uh, and West Ham play. They're going to be playing in a completely different way. And we've seen earlier in the season that we like teams playing that way. Yes, I'm sure they'll be, we'll concede chances, but we're also going to create chances and we're going to relish that challenge. And I'm sure... I wouldn't be surprised if we pull off some some surprise results. Yeah, I'm sure we're not going to win all three, and I'm sure it's that you know there'll be some games maybe we lose, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's some shock results in there. Yeah, uh, me as well. And everyone goes to me like, oh yeah, but uh, every team gets injuries. No, nobody has coped with an injury crisis as Spurs have. Look at Man United; they've had a similar amount of injury crisis all season. We're 11 points behind them. Would they finish third last season? Mm -hmm. um, look at Newcastle; finished fourth last season. They've had a similar amount of injury crisis to us. Look at them; they're mid-table, sitting around 10th or 9th, mm -hmm. wherever they are. So it's incredible the job that Andrew Postecoglou has done. And um, yeah, I think we'll leave it there. But I think. I think uh, people need to stop going so overboard of the negativity about how Spurs are going and the direction Spurs are going and, oh, we're going to lose this game, we're going to lose that game. Like Things are going great at the moment and um, you need to realise where you're at as a football club and this is where we're at right now. Um, mm -hmm. And to be challenging for fourth and in fourth with uh, seven games to go, I think is a brilliant testament to Ange, uh, like I said. So that is your match review and a bit of an insight into where we think the club is at at the moment as well.